This year, 254,000 young men and women will graduate from Canadian universities, ready to conquer the world, or at least take their place in it. Today, I can confidently say that we are ready. But are they ready for a rude awakening? As they launch into a world of work that's undergoing a seismic shift. By 2030, over half of the jobs in the world are going to, to transition. They're going to disappear. And Canadian institutions are not keeping up. Higher education is actually preparing people for jobs of the past. I don't understand why we're pushing more people into university and college so that they can graduate with debt and not be able to find a job. Those lucky enough to find employment are often overqualified for the jobs they're forced to accept. Serving has no future. It's a dead end. Jobless and underemployed young people today can mean a bankrupt Canada tomorrow. Canada will be in the decline because future wealth is built on people's skills, on the skills of the population. While the crisis deepens, the generation in power only makes things worse. How did this happen that boomers became the architects of a scorched earth public policy for the next generation? Are we not supposed to be stewards for the next generation? We have an entire nation of highly educated, underemployed, creative people who are starting to kind of feel like they were sold a fraud. In Canada, the recession has eased for many, but not for young people. Youth unemployment is double the general population, just under 15%. Compared to four years ago, there are a quarter of a million fewer young people with jobs. Economist Francis Fong reports on economic and social issues for TD Bank. His recent report, The Plight of Younger Workers, paints a brutal picture. It's always the case that youths face the worst of it. They bear the brunt of it. And it's the simple fact that they are always the most vulnerable. They're the ones with the least experience, the least skills. So they're always the first ones to get let go. So what that means is we are sidelining a, a very large group of people on whom we're going to be very reliant in the next 20 years. So the question becomes, is the biggest economic and fiscal drag facing Canada's future the elderly? or the fact that we're not using the potential of these young people. I expected by the time I was an adult that I would own my own apartment, that I would have a job where I wore high heels <laughs> and business suits. I don't know. 29-year-old Azaria Bata graduated four years ago with a degree in urban geography, planning on a career helping build greener cities. She landed a few temporary contracts, like Vancouver's Bike to Work Week, but nothing she could rely on long term. At the moment, I'm working as a server in a Japanese restaurant. The restaurant is close to the University of British Columbia, and it's largely staffed with university grads. Tessa has a degree in international relations with a minor in Spanish. Katrina, a history degree with a minor in international relations. Alexandra, a BA in modern European studies and history. This crew is among the growing number of young people who are clearly underemployed in jobs that don't require a degree, turning their investment in higher education into pointless debt and marooning them at a dead end. The service industry is always referred to as a trap because the money that you make there is comparable to a really good job. It's a dead end. Serving has no future, but you get kind of stuck on the road. Canada has one of the highest graduate underemployment rates in all of the OECD countries. A Canadian Policy Research Network's report estimates that one in three college and university grads between the ages of 25 and 29 end up in low-skilled jobs. Aaron Lawrence. In the not-too-distant past, a degree was virtually a guarantee of a secure full-time job. Not anymore. In fact, we're sort of facing this issue that we like to call education inflation, in which 
everybody in the labor market these days has something, has some form of post-secondary education. There is this kind of assumption that everybody has a B, A, or S. It's just like another step in like your high school education. Like it doesn't mean anything. The degree is worth less, but tuition has skyrocketed, and students are racking up major debt to pay for it. 60% of students graduate in the hole. The average debt, $27,000. Students and grads often turn to online career sites like Talent Egg that connect them with employers across the country. As a student graduating into the workplace, the second that you have left campus, you're almost like, I think of it as like a car on the lot. So a car on the lot, let's say, is worth $40,000. The second it's driven off the lot, it's worth twenty. dollars And that's the same, and that's how I see students in the, in, in, that are transitioning from school to work. They're, you know, while they're still in school, they, they, it's almost like they're employed, they're doing something, they're students. The second they're not, they, became, they become unemployed. And we all know how much harder it is to find a job when you're unemployed. So, I framed my uh, $30,000 piece of paper so I can put it up in my room and show everybody that I graduated and I got a degree. When 24-year-old Andrew Karam graduated as a civil engineer, he fully expected to land a job that would pay 50 grand a year. After all, his is no general arts degree. His education trained him in a profession. But one year later, Andrew's still looking. This one's got one to two years experience, but I don't even have that. Andrew sent out more than a hundred resumes. And even has his mother handing them out to clients. I already gave a couple of them out. I don't know if they called you. Did they call you? Nobody? I couldn't find a job. I got two interviews in about eight months. So not many interviews. For now, Andrew makes money working in construction with his dad. My dad lectures me all the time. Did you find a job yet? Did you get a job? Did you get a job? They're always on my case. The story that young people have been told is that if you do the right things, if you go to school, get a university education, you will be rewarded with the trappings of a comfortable middle-class life. I think in many ways, young people who are graduating now feel as though they have a whole team behind them. And if they don't succeed, they're letting down the team. My parents are in constant worry about me. Like, it's so much pressure. And it's not like they're disappointed with me. They just are like, why aren't you a star? <laughs> but parents' expectations and youthful dreams of big salaries and fast promotions crash head on into the new reality. A workplace increasingly shaped by globalization and automation. Companies fixated on the bottom line are outsourcing or getting computers to do the work. In fact, a lot of employers are using the opportunity of this anxiety that's generally out there and creating this two-tier environment where older workers may be red circled, you're fine until you retire. But the young'uns that we're bringing along to replace you, they will have lower wages, lower benefits, lower pensions. We haven't seen anything like this in almost 100 years when bosses are asking people to take less money when they're already profitable. By 2030, um, I actually think that over half of the jobs in the world are going to, to transition. They're going to disappear. A former engineer and designer for IBM, Thomas Fry now spends his time analyzing trends. As we create these new automations, it's eliminating 10,000 jobs at a time. It's happening with greater frequency than ever in the past. Like cars that drive themselves. No longer science fiction, they're already on the road. In the not too distant future, there go taxi drivers, bus drivers, truck drivers, even pizza delivery guys. White collar jobs aren't safe either. Lawyers are being replaced by software that can analyze legal documents. Robots can fill prescriptions and replace pharmacists. As a consequence, we're gonna to have to figure out ways of, of building new jobs, creating new jobs faster than ever before. If you think that the internet and social media will create those jobs, think again. They generate wealth, no doubt, but they do not create many jobs. 
Here's a shocker. If you gathered together all the employees of Facebook, Twitter, Groupon, and LinkedIn, you could easily fit them all into Madison Square Garden. These companies are collectively valued at close to $80 billion, yet they employ fewer than 20,000 people worldwide. So for young people trying to get a toehold in the economy, the pool of jobs is drying up. And what remains are not the full-time secure jobs of the past. So in fact, when you take a look at what kind of jobs these young people are getting, because young people are getting some jobs, the vast majority of them are temporary. So temporary contracts, casual work, seasonal work, certainly nothing that is leading to a full-time career. This is no short-term economic blip. It's a new business model where part-time and temporary work is the new normal. There's a lot of young people today that are looking for a full-time job, but that's a different world than what we're actually living in. The average person that turns 30 years old has had 11 different jobs. My prediction is that in just 10 years, the average person that turns 30 years old will have worked between two to 300 different projects. We're becoming a much more project-based society. And for the first time in history, young people are competing for those projects and jobs with their parents' generation, boomers who are delaying retirement. Back in the 70s and the 80s, you would never have expected to compete with someone who was 68 for the same job. You know, these people have 40 years of work experience on you. Management experience, you know, probably some more schooling. And, but they're competing for the same job. That's very unique. We did not see that competitive pressure being faced by any other cohort of young people. Coming up, does higher education actually lower your chances of finding a job? An employer is less likely to hire them because they have higher salary expectations, and of course they do. They have more debt, they have more education, of course they're expecting more. They have no work experience. And next, a Canadian university that guarantees grads a job. Every parent I've talked to has said, oh, I want my child in that program. Every single parent. A handful of Canadian universities are making accountability to their students a priority. The University of Regina is the first in Canada to guarantee that grads will find a job related to their degree. The number one reason students come to university in today's society and the number one motivation for parents is for their child to get a successful career. Uh, we can't ignore that. If within six months University of Regina grads don't find a job in their chosen field, they can come back for another year to hone their skills for a better fit into the labor market. And this extra year is free. How can the university make such a guarantee? They're building on four decades of success. A co-op program in which students get hands-on job experience while going to school. Our students earn $8.3 million a year. They can pay their university all of their costs through their co-op program. The U of Regina guarantee takes the co-op program a giant step further by combining the work experience with other programs focused on helping students find work. Each student is assigned a career counselor and they're required to take workshops in resume writing, interview skills, and networking. From day one, the focus is not on getting an abstract education, but on stepping out of school into a career. How you doing? Good, come on in. So, how's it going? Good, how you doing? The switch to engineering is, is doing you well? Oh yeah, it's doing awesome. Just as General Sciences student Ryan Clark could have been heading toward post-grad underemployment. Taking part in the Guarantee program convinced him to switch to environmental engineering with much better job prospects. It's already landed him a summer job. I've gotten a job to work for Sask Environment. It's flying a helicopter to take water samples. That, for me, is the dream job. That is really something I could make a career out of. It's something I really enjoy doing. The UR guarantee has only been in place for three years, so it's not yet been truly tested. But confidence is high because the guarantee is building on that already proven co-op program. Our students get jobs. The last survey showed that 97% of our students got employment. So, you know, that's a very positive story. Compare the Regina experience with what's offered, or not, at most universities. 
I felt like it was a, a huge loss out of my university experience not being coached into like what our degrees would actually translate to in like a real-time job. Why are so many universities ignoring the day after graduation? These institutions are not in any way incentivized to help students figure out their career. That is not the goal of a university, especially a research university, which are in a lot of cases the most highly regarded among the schools across the country. But the expectations of employers have changed, and either universities and colleges need to step up and include career education and preparation as part of their curriculum, or we need to stop funneling so many students through this program that then leaves them with debt and unemployment on the other side. In Canada, we don't actually know how many students are being funneled through universities in any given field of study. That's because there's no national strategy for post-secondary education that requires universities to gather that kind of information and then share it with each other. They don't calculate the number of graduates in the same way in any particular program from university to university. We don't actually know in Canada how many history graduates we have in any particular year. We don't know how many people dropped out of sociology last year across Canada. So how can universities separately be responsive to the needs of the labor market if they don't even know what's happening across the country in any particular field. So no wonder the poor learner is stuck there thinking that the university is just trying to get bums in seats because if there's no strategy, if there are no goals, then however good the people are within those institutions, they won't produce what the country needs. Or they'll produce too much of what the country doesn't need. The province of Ontario has the worst oversupply of teachers in the country, yet universities continue to turn them out. For the past decade, the Ontario College of Teachers has been tracking newly certified grads. It's not a pretty picture. Today, one year after graduating, how many new teachers are either unemployed or underemployed? 67%. Fully one in three of the new teachers found no teaching work at all, and they could not find even daily supply teaching. Thank you for coming today. I... Teachers Union President George Taylor regularly meets with young, underemployed teachers. Dan's been substituting for nine years while juggling other jobs to make ends meet. I, I have done tutoring, uh, but I, I also deliver pizzas. I, I find that when I, you know, when I see people uh, I haven't seen in a while and they ask what I'm doing and I say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm still supply teaching, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed because, oh, you're still doing that? After all this time, you haven't got a, a full-time job? And Marie has also been on call for almost a decade. I think the colleges have a lot to blame that they're accepting so many education students when they know the jobs aren't there and then there's overflow from 10 years and people that have come back to the profession as well in that time. Having coffee at a nearby table, one of those people, a retired teacher who's still in the classroom. Paul Hoskin retired 13 years ago, but he's been substitute teaching ever since. At my age, I still feel good, I still feel energized, and I feel more energized when I'm with kids. Retired teachers double dipping is often blamed for the teacher job shortage. But even if all the retirees stepped out of the classroom tomorrow, it wouldn't solve the oversupply problem. New teachers would still be spending quite a number of years before they get regular teaching positions because the overall glut is so large now. Ontario colleges and universities pump out about 8,000 teachers a year. Add to that 3,000 more who train out of province. That's 11,000 new teachers with only some 4,600 retiring annually. That's bad math, even with some small corrections currently underway. We're in the third year of, of a reduction of about 1,000 places in, in our faculties of education, and the province is talking about much more significant reductions. While governments and schools talk about reductions, a generation of young would-be teachers is being sidelined. I feel badly, in a sense, for young teachers who want to teach. But I would say to that young person, before you spend thousands of dollars enrolling in a teacher's college or faculty of education, look at job opportunities and realistically ask yourself, 
am I going to get a job? Across the country, there are too few jobs for too many teachers. But in other sectors of the economy, employers say they can't find enough skilled workers. Well, a lot of it is a mismatch in the kinds of skills, uh, abilities, and knowledge that companies need and the kinds of uh, skills, knowledge, and abilities that people have. Communitech is a hub for 800 technology companies in Waterloo, Ontario, Silicon North. Companies here could easily employ a thousand or more people, but they have to be the right people. What companies are looking for is, is technology, application developers, uh, you know, computer engineers, software engineers, but there's also a need for things that are more of an intersection of different types of, of skills. So it's those intersections between science, technology, and business, between arts and technology. So all these grads in general arts and sciences would be more likely to find work if their education included technology skills. But young people don't necessarily know this because they don't have access to labor market information that tells them what jobs are in demand. In an ideal world, a learner will have all of the information about the labor market in terms of what the trends will be, where employment will be, what sectors they will be in. Hard to do in Canada, where the federal government relies on industry-led sector councils made up of business, labor, and educators to provide vital labor market information. The federal government financially supports the sector councils on a project-by-project -project basis if it's something that they've applied for that's going to meet our objectives of gathering and better labor market information, sharing that information, then we'll support that and we do financially. The sector councils don't have the core funding that they need to be able to do good work. Their funding, ha funding has been reduced. But the most important thing is they do things on a project-by-project -project basis, one year at a time, one project at a time. That doesn't give you a strategy, that just gives you a series of projects. So when people don't have that information on the labour market, they just make guesses. When those initial guesses are wrong, a sad cycle begins. The longer they're unemployed or underemployed, the less likely a graduate is to find work in their field. And so many are going back to school, accumulating more debt to pay for specialized training at technical institutions and colleges, the new finishing schools. Others take their chances and return to university to get a higher degree, hoping more credentials will help jumpstart their career. Like Andrew Karam, whose undergrad degree in civil engineering was getting him nowhere, so he's going back for a master's. I couldn't find a job or start a career, so the only logical option for me was to go back to school. I think that a lot of times students make the choice to go back to get their master's, uh, to pursue a PhD to get some sort of graduate degree for the wrong reasons. They do it because they don't know what to do. They don't know how to get a job. But what they're doing in that case is they are paying money to get further education and absolutely no work experience. So an employer is less likely to hire them because they have higher salary expectations. And of course they do. They have more debt. They have more education. Of course they're expecting more. They have no work experience. They are harder to, it is harder to get a job. So how do you get work experience that you can put on a resume? Many unemployed grads are working for free, hoping it will eventually lead to a paycheck. There's a whole cloud of rhetoric around internships, that they are a win-win situation, that it's about young people getting a foot in the door, paying their dues. In his book, Intern Nation, Ross Perlin blew the lid off what he clearly sees as exploitation. Saving on labor costs, this is from an employer's perspective, has become in many ways the principal objective of having internship, to use young people as a form of cheap disposable labor. For years, unpaid internships were a rite of passage into glamour industries like journalism, film, and fashion. It's now something we see across the whole white-collar world in just about every field you can think of. Perlin estimates that there are between one and two million interns in the United States half of them unpaid. And this is contributing to a growing gap in North American society between the haves and the have-nots. This is one of the issues about internships that people don't get, but perhaps it's the most important point. People who can afford to pay to play uh, are given an advantage. People who don't need that wage can offer their labor for free. 
Unpaid internships are alive and well in Canada. Kelly Fallis owns the Toronto web-based design firm Remote Stylist. According to the website, customers can consult with an interior designer for free. And free is where the interns come in. At least half of the company's staff is unpaid. Their employer thinks it's a fair trade-off for valuable experience. My interns are not standing around, you know, filing papers, going to get coffee, etc. Um, they're given real responsibility from the beginning. Here, an intern's first 60 days are entirely unpaid, a kind of test drive for a job. After that, there's a small stipend, and after that, there's a possibility, but no guarantee, of a full-time job. In the three years the company's been in business, 50 interns have come and, mostly, gone. Julian feels lucky to have even this toehold in his chosen profession. Nowadays, a lot of us finish our degrees and have to go into McDonald's or, you know, Burger King or whatever else. There's such stiff competition for this unpaid work that even repeat interns often say they feel lucky. I'm a serial intern. Every time someone hires you, they say, this is going to look great on your resume. You need to, this is great. This, and one day, this will really open doors for you, and you're kind of like, well... Has that day come? And no one, no one is there to kind of flag you down and say, oh, you've arrived, by the way, just so you, you can stop interning now. It just seems like this sort of endless cycle. A lot of people literally only see the fact that, you know, somehow the company is winning and the intern is losing. You know, if you're getting real valuable experience and you're excited about the opportunity, um, it, it's a win-win. Each province is different, but in Ontario, to be legal, an unpaid internship must provide training similar to what's given in vocational schools. I would say 95% of unpaid internships are illegal uh, in Ontario. To be legal, an internship must benefit the intern, not just the employer. And the intern can't replace the work of a paid employee. Many companies don't know that they're breaking the law. It's just something that governments do not have any wherewithal to address. There's like, no interest in dealing with the issues that young workers are facing. Unpaid internships aren't supposed to be slave labor. They're supposed to be a route into paid work. But maybe they're actually deepening the unemployment crisis. That conversation has, has really started over the past year or so. Because people saw we're shooting ourselves in the foot, maybe the entry-level job is disappearing. Maybe youth unemployment is at an all-time high, partly because so many of us are willing to work for free. Coming up, a country where youth unemployment is 2.8% and young people are considered a national priority. Most of the young people coming out of post-secondary education don't have problems finding uh, jobs. Getting a trade used to be what a young person did if they weren't cut out for university. Not anymore. Now, university grads are competing to get into apprenticeship programs, and it's not easy. I know that there's lots of people saying, you know, if you, if you can't use your degree, then get into the trades. And we encourage people to do that. But the, the challenge is, is getting past the entry level. To be, become an apprentice, you need to have a job first. Chad Roberts spent $5,000 on a Millwright pre-apprenticeship program. He was told it would give him an advantage in finding work as an apprentice. And so, you know, that sounds great, so sign me up kind of deal. Days after completing his program, Chad and a couple of his classmates head to a northern job fair. Companies here are looking for skilled tradespeople to fill as many as 10,000 jobs expected to open up in northern BC during the next decade. Over the next two and a half years, we'll probably employ 1,800 workers. I'm looking for 110 people in Western Canada alone. It's the same story across the country. A critical shortage of tradespeople looms on the horizon. You'd think this must be good news for these would-be apprentices. Not so much. They could only find one employer who would even take their resumes. But everybody wants three to five years experience before you can start working there, so it kind of puts us in the dark. Companies want workers who are fully productive, instantly. They don't want to make an investment in young people. 
I hear from employers a lot, it costs us too much. It would be cheaper to get a temporary foreign worker than it would be to hire a young person and train them to do the job. It's a major barrier. It's been a barrier for years to apprenticeship and jobs in the trade. But our research shows that for every dollar uh, an employer invests, they can expect an average return of $1.47, which means that they, it is not costing you money to hire an apprentice and train them. Canada is among the lowest ranked countries in the OECD in terms of ex employer support, financial support for education and training at the workplace. They don't have that mentality that many European countries have that is part of the responsibility of an employer of being a corporate citizen to provide the training. Switzerland, youth unemployment rate 2.8%, the lowest in the developed world. Here, the idea of young people with diplomas or degrees and no job prospects is unheard of. The reason is because we uh, streamed them already before upper secondary education in, in two different uh, types of education. At 15 years old, the end of grade nine, young people must choose between continuing general high school with a view to university or beginning an apprenticeship. There are a staggering number of apprenticeship streams available, 230. Everywhere you have an occupation in the economy, we try to establish also an apprenticeship. The vast majority of students, fully two-thirds, choose to apprentice. Many are in white-collar jobs like healthcare, IT, and banking. 17-year-olds Basil Vithian and Stephanie Petkova are in sought-after apprenticeships at BCBE, a Swiss state bank. They certainly could have qualified for university, but opted to apprentice instead, like 40% of Switzerland's top students. I also wanted to work, not study every day, five, to, five uh, days a week. I, I want to, to, and also earn money. Apprentices spend three or four days a week working for an employer and earning a salary. The rest of their time is spent in school. 19-year-old Lucas Gruter is in the fourth year of an apprenticeship in agricultural mechanics. The Swiss understand that students learn best by doing, not simply sitting in a classroom. If you go to the traditional general school setting, you're learning for years things that you don't know why you are learning them. You're learning it because your teacher tells you it's important. In the apprenticeship training system, the learning setting is completely different. You learn things in the morning and you apply them in the afternoon. Employer federations from all sectors of the economy are responsible for designing and assessing the apprenticeship programs. So this federation then sets up the curriculum, the standards, the tests, the exams, everything. The government then puts the stamp on it. But in the driving seat of all this are the employers. That means that the training matches demand in the market. Lucas is pretty much assured of a job at the end of his apprenticeship. There are about 300 jobs waiting, so for a machine mechanic without job in Switzerland doesn't exist. The same is true for Stephanie and Basil. By the time they're 18, they'll be able to find work in a bank or any other commercial business. I've grew from a child to a young woman because I've learned to be responsible for myself. There is an ethos of work. People growing up here are learning very early on that being part of the society is also working. From a Canadian perspective, it might look like Swiss students are asked to make career choices too early. I don't think we were too young to make this decision because you, you can change your life. Nobody's locked into their first choice. The Swiss system allows students to move easily between apprenticeship and academic streams. At the end of the first apprenticeship, they are 18 years old. So if they spend another three years and learn another trade, another occupation, they're still young after the second one. I would have to go to school a little bit longer, but it is possible for me to go to engineering school. After this, I will make my professional baccalaureate, and after that, I don't know, maybe uh, I, go, I will go to university. Swiss universities offer the same kinds of degrees as their Canadian counterparts. 
One big difference, only 20% of all high school students are allowed into university. We only allow the most talented and motivated and willing young people into university education. So those people are very sought after and the majority of them, it's, it's no problem finding a job after university. In a country with few natural resources, Switzerland's highly skilled workforce is a major asset, so young people are a national priority. The federal government takes the lead in an education to work strategic alliance, one that includes provincial governments, schools and employers. In Canada, that close collaboration does not exist. It's the most fragmented, decentralized country in education in the world. But in fact, it is the only country in the world without a national ministry of education, and it shows. In Canada, the responsibility for education falls to individual provinces. Responsibility for youth employment and the labor market is split between federal and provincial governments. The result, a disjointed system with lots of cracks for young people to fall through. I characterize the current federal government posture about employment and skills training as being one of ineptitude, one of indifference, and one of inertia. Inertia because if we want to succeed for young people, or for anybody in fact in, in this current environment, a very globally competitive environment, we need to do things on a national basis, we need a national strategy. There's complete inertia with respect to that, we don't have one, and there's not one in the making. But according to the federal minister in charge of human resources, a national strategy would step on provincial toes. There are certain jurisdictional issues, and we have to recognize that provinces are responsible for almost all of the delivery of education and training programs in this country. But we do work constantly with all of the different provinces and territories, each of which has a different priority. There is such an ideological predisposition to saying the federal government does one thing and the provinces do everything else. That's the province's uh, jurisdiction and there's nothing we can do about it. So they sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's it. We've got a firewall in terms of jurisdiction. We don't need to work together in, in this way. We don't need a national strategy, thank you very much, because the provinces are doing fine on their own. But they're not, and nor are individual learners doing fine on their own. Coming up, is Canada abandoning the next generation? Your generation had it so easy compared to my generation. Oh, wow, thank you. Wow. Try style salad rolls with wow. peanut sauce. Azaria Bata and friends get together now and again to swap war stories. They're all around 30, well-educated, hard-working, and most of them underemployed, watching their career dreams evaporate. My mom and dad regularly, especially my dad, regularly sends me emails uh, talking about how maybe we're the lost generation. I guess when people say that our generation is a lost generation, it would make me mad. It would, yeah, definitely make me feel a little like, well, screw you, like, your generation had it so easy compared to my generation. This might not be the lost generation, but they sure are unlucky. At the moment they were stepping into adulthood, the world spun away from them. The very nature of work changed dramatically. And then the global recession hit. They are still reeling, putting on hold any idea of buying their own homes or starting families. We have an entire nation of highly educated, underemployed, creative people who are starting to kind of feel like they were sold a fraud. Our parents' generation has already spent all the money, and they won't retire because they're all so much in debt anyways, that they can't retire, and they keep bumping up the age limit, so they're not giving us room to get into the job market. One group of people is doing very well, and they happen to be older, and they happen to have got the best of what Canada had to offer when they were younger. And it's precisely that group that is saying, oops, we gotta balance our books. We gotta have tax cuts. We gotta get government back living in within its means. How did this happen that boomers became the architects of a scorched earth public policy for the next generation? Are we not supposed to be stewards for the next generation? The economy has permanently shifted and major changes must happen to forge a way in for young people. There may not be a quick fix, but if countries like Switzerland have managed it, why not Canada? You would have to change how the economy 
uh, is uh, organized, how the economy talks to the government. And those are things that uh, take years, if not decades, uh, to install all these kind of partnerships and rules and regulations. So you can, you, you can do it, but it would take one or two generations to change all this. It would take a coordinated effort among educators, business, and government, and it would take political will. But without a radical shift, it's not only this generation that will be lost. Increasingly, countries' wealth, their productivity, their innovation depends on the skills that they have as a population. And if our young people aren't getting the training and support for training the information that they deserve and that they need, they won't have the skills that match those of other countries. Other countries will eat our lunch and we will be as a country managing decline. While policymakers doze, young people are scrambling to adapt. And I think that, you know, the strongest survive. It's maybe gonna force us to to, like I said, become more creative in, in in finding employment and, or... And also force us to question what kind of lifestyle we need to live, right? Mm -hmm. So how much money do we really need to make? Because we've been grown up on the debt of our parents, we've lived a lifestyle that maybe, maybe we won't actually get to achieve. Like, I don't expect to own a house. That's not, that's not even part of my whole worldview or gamut and never will be. <laughs> What's a problem for young people today could be a catastrophe for all Canadians down the road. Who will buy boomers' houses? Who will pay for social programs? Canada is not out of the woods economically until the jobless generation is. I do feel like maybe we are the lost generation or maybe it is hard, but people are still going for it. Like, people aren't giving up. Like, my priorities have changed. And I think a lot of us. How can we not be hopeful about the future? That's I mean, right. we're only alive I'm once. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm if, we're not to, if we're not hopeful about the future, then what is there? I, I feel like we need to be more resilient, right? And that's the trick. But I'm not, I don't feel lost at all. We're not I lost. feel lost. We're not lost. We're just trying to find our way. <laughs> <laughs>